back, everybody, to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo. Joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. We got a lot to discuss. We got that fourth episode of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which was amazing. We got to talk about the Invisible episode number five, I believe, mm-hmm. which was uh, another amazing show. Uh, a, a new trailer for Jupiter's, I think it was the first trailer, actually, right? For Jupiter's... The reveal yeah. trailer for it's Jupiter. Because the first one was just um, artwork. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jupiter's legacy was uh, something to look forward to. We got the Ray Fisher saga that I think has probably come to an end somewhat. Uh, but we'll get a little bit of a, into a discussion about that. And we're going to discuss... The Parliament, something that we have mentioned in past episodes, we're going to finally get into a little bit of a discussion about how this uh, MCU world has been created, and uh, that's going to be a very interesting conversation. Brian, how you doing? Good, man. Um, You can't wait to talk about the shows this week, because I think we've got some really, really good shows in progress right now. Just every week, it's appointment viewing yeah man yeah let's get into it falcon and the winter soldier episode four spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen it that opening sequence when i saw it and i had a chance to think about it i believe this scene touched many people who struggle to get through a certain hurdle in their lives. Uh, Something that they're trying to get over, whether it be, I would say addiction or whatever the case may be, but it was something that was uh, very intense for Sebastian Stan. By the way, he did a fantastic job in displaying those emotions. And it was a memorable scene. It was perhaps one of the best scenes in all of the Marvel shows that I've seen thus far. It was one of the best. Um, the rest of the episode with Dora Milaje, I, we didn't get a chance to get into that conversation as to who was sent, who or who sent them, but. Obviously, they were sent to go deal with Zemo because they they have their ear to the ground. They know everything was going on in the world, I guess, right? And immediately, they got on it. They wanted Zemo. And Zemo, again, another fantastic showing from on his part. He, he He's always dropping those little gems that people like, although they don't like the guy, they tend to agree with some of the stuff that, or, or, or at least ponder some of the things that he says. Uh, Brian, what did you think of that episode, man? A lot of thoughts. So the opening, first off, I felt like Marvel was playing with us a little bit because of the way they did the text. Because the first shot, it says Wakanda. And in my mind, I'm like, Oh, we're going to Wakanda now. <laughs> and then it says six years ago. And yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so so yep. it felt like a little bit of gotcha. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, you know, this is a, that scene was a great example of, we hear in Hollywood a lot of times these days when they're doing prequels and all that sort of stuff, a lot of times they give you the backstory to something you don't care about, right? They give you, I don't mean Marvel, I just mean, Hollywood in general. They give you a story where it's like, I never really thought about that for two seconds. But this was really critical because if you remember when Winter Soldier is first brought to Wakanda, they basically freeze him because he's too dangerous to be let loose. Yes. And we kind of pick the story up later on when he basically is rehabbed and he has his new arm. So there is this gap of Mm -hmm. how did we get from too lethal to be let out to that quote in, I think it's Infinity War, what is it like the white wolf has rested long yeah, enough? Yes, yes, yes. So that's an example of really smart storytelling where there's a gap there that we need to understand. 
Yeah. And I think that scene not only establishes, to your point, he, a little bit of his personal struggle that connects to this show, but it also makes, as we talked about last time, and I mentioned this, there's a relationship between him and the people of Wakanda that goes beyond just a matter of convenience because they had the technology to heal him. Mm -hmm. It is on a personal level, and that really ties through into his actions in this show, in releasing Zima, which obviously yeah. is personal to, to Wakanda as well. So I thought that was expertly done and really set off a chain reaction of an episode I found incredibly enjoyable. It's been interesting to read people feeling like there's not enough Easter egg dropping and stuff going on. And I'm kind of enjoying not having as much of that because this show is moving at breakneck speed yeah. and the central themes and characters are just so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on that. I mean, when I'm first watching the shows, yeah, certain things that may, you may see little Easter eggs, things here and there, but I sort of, you know, just try to take in each scene and what the characters are saying. I'm trying to focus on what's happening other than looking in the Easter eggs and then having to miss some of uh, some important plot details and then having to go back to watch it. So I'm usually tuned into what people are saying and yeah. Um, Captain America, the people, people seem to hate him in real life. <laughs> and you sort of, they dive further into his struggle of being this or becoming this icon that's supposed to, you know, he's supposed to live up to this this person who is Steve Rogers and Captain America. And, and he's finding it incredibly difficult to uh, move forward in his new role, right? And I was under the impression that he possibly, I think in the last episode that we, we, we talked about this, I had mentioned that he, we, we didn't know if he had taken the Super Soldier's Serum. Obviously now we know he didn't. And you can sort of tell that this was something weighing on his mind that if he had it, he would probably be able to live up to that Steve Rogers uh, aura. Because he, he, you know, he kept asking, well, he asked uh, Battlestar, would you have taken it? And the other dude was like, hell yeah. Zemo asked uh, Sam, would he have taken it? And you get different answers from different people, but obviously it was something that um, John Walker, he believed he needed, especially after getting beaten by the Dora Milaje. When you see that reaction after it was done, the, the fight sequence there, they, didn't, they, they weren't even super soldiers. And he got beat. So that was definitely weighing on his mind. What did you think about that sequence from him sort of, you can sort of see uh, him struggling with not being on par with Steve Rogers. Yeah, basically, he's 1998 Barry Bonds in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> he's watching. He's like, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa are going out, hitting all these home runs, <laughs> winning all these MVPs. I've got three MVPs, like three medals of honor, and now I'm getting my ass kicked by yeah. all these people. I need an edge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> that's basically what he did. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, like... I, I think of this episode, what they did a really nice job of with this storyline was weaving in that reference to Steve Rogers with the flag smasher, right? The one flag smasher is like, hey, I looked up to that guy. Yeah. Like, I appreciated that guy. And you start to feel that presence of what is Captain America, right? It's yeah. not the serum. It's what Dr. Erskine always said. It's 
this. With, with it, right? Yes, yes, yes. And you see in this episode, Sam plays this. And this, his head and his heart, is what appeals to Carly and what sort of makes more progress than Walker's physicality and his brute strength, which ultimately leads to a Roy Rage murder, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but they like. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think they did a really nice job with that contrast of like, here's the physicality of Captain America gone wrong, and here's the, the integrity and the virtue of Captain America, which validates Steve's faith in Sam, in which yeah. he's trying to talk down the terrorist and he's appealing to her humanity and yeah, he believes yeah. in her inter- inherent goodness, not in the horrible acts. So you kind of see that parallel track. And so this was the first episode, quite honestly, where I felt like Sam took a real step to becoming Captain America and we saw it on screen. Yes, 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 yes. Uh... Next week is supposed to be, uh, from what I've heard, is a much longer episode. And there is supposed to be a, apparently a huge cameo. Mm-hmm. Here we are again, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Who's who's this cameo? Apparently, we haven't seen this person before. It's or... the power broker, I'm assuming, but... It, Sharon, well, it's Emily Van Camp who plays Sharon Carter is the one who dropped the it's a new character. Okay, it's a new character. <laughs> what do you think? Who do you think it is? I can't, I can't, I, I was thinking that the power broker would probably be um, Thunderbolt Ross and him trying to create his Thunderbolts team. It doesn't seem based on what you just said you just said it doesn't seem to be the case it's like who who, who would it be so th- th- this goes back to my prior discussion about easter eggs so in a, i feel like the wandavision we had so much fun in the week to week build up because of the hype that was coming in about oh are we going to see mephisto we're going to see magneto we're going to see who and i think Stepping back from that show after it completed, I think it was ultimately fun, but took a little bit away from the show. Oh, yeah. We felt let down in yeah, a way yeah, yeah. by a very good show because it didn't deliver this huge new character, yeah, yeah. like a Reed Richards or whoever. Yeah. So I kind of like this show has gone the opposite direction. They've taken great pains to drop no hints about the power broker other than the name so quite honestly i don't have a clue what we're in for and yeah. i kind of like it better that way because i almost feel like now whatever we get is going to be a positive surprise there really is nothing no expectation that's been created so i don't have a good feel based on the mythology as to who this person is going to be unless yeah. it there is a power broker in the comics but it almost doesn't feel like a character for these times. Um, so I, I'm really kind of at a loss. I almost feel like it's got to be somebody that ties into the broader universe somehow in a more meaningful way. But I'm not sure who that could be. You know, it's interesting. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier has been been shot for some time now. They were working on this for a while. And you would almost think that you would you would think that they would be like, oh, Let's get people off of this Easter egg sort of situation with WandaVision. You know, people were let down for some reason. We don't want people to go that route. We, we, we want people to focus on the show. And it's almost it almost feels somewhat deliberate in them having to focus on the story rather than all these Easter eggs and who this person is. It's, it's, it's weird, but I, you know, it, 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 kudos to them for not revealing so much that we can really theorize who this person is. Because if this is a brand new person, then there's no one we can really guess other than you know trying to find things to 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 hold on to and sort of make these guesses that probably aren't you know aren't going to come to pass. And there's no actor or actress on the cast sheet 
that's unaccounted for at this point either, right? No known person that we're like, hey, that person hasn't shown up, so it must be that person. We're kind of in the dark. Like I said, like in the comics, it was a it was a guy named Curtis Jackson, which I it just kind of was like a Caucasian businessman, right? No relation to Fifty Cent. <laughs> um, and then you know, like if he ultimately was, I think he was ultimately taken out by the Punisher at some point. That was sort of the end of his arc. But none of that seems to fit with where yeah. we're going here. To be honest, so. I expect it will be someone else that ties into the multiverse in some way that's being installed into this role. That's my best guess. But. Yeah. You know what I found annoying is the head, the head tilts, man. The head tilts was just getting a little bit too like, you know, they were constantly doing like, come on, man, let's do something else. But listen, the show is fantastic. It's getting better and better each week. And next week is, it seems like it's promising to be a, like a really fantastic show and a long show. So do you, where are you on Carly Morgenthau at this point in the sense of, so one is, I thought this was another standout episode for her. Um, I thought of the funeral scene, kind of the inspiration. And then even the dialogue with Sam, I thought was pretty genuine. Yeah, yeah. I find myself hoping that she survives the show. Yeah, uh, it's for me, it's pretty, it's not that difficult to get into her character. I'm just so used to wanting to see the Marvel characters. This is sort of brand new for me, right? Uh, for this character. So it's hard for me to really pay attention to her uh, storyline. But I'm not going to sit here and say that it's a bad storyline or I don't care. It's just that I'm more interested in the grander uh, uh, things that are, are going to happen in the future with the, the shows and the characters that they introduce. This one just seems to be similar to uh, what the guy, the guy that got arrested at the end of WandaVision, the general or whatever. The, uh, oh, oh, right. Yeah. Like the head of sword. Yeah, exactly. So it's one of those things, but her she, she she her her character and what she's doing, you know, you, you're paying attention. But on the grand scheme of things, it's like I I want to see what else happens outside yeah, of okay. that. Let us know what you thought about this episode. You have any more questions about? You have anything? Well, Zemo's Endgame, I think, is the other the other real storyline. I think we knew he would double cross them, and he kind of did but he didn't like he kind of just set up a crossfire he didn't really like betray them outright you know he kind of just slipped away so i think the question becomes we know his motivation has primarily been to eliminate superheroes he has yeah. successfully destroyed all the serum now unclear to me what his next sort of gambit is going to be but he's clearly not done with this show so i am curious to see like he all of this, he's been a step ahead this entire time. So I'm assuming he already knew exactly where he was intending to go when his escape moment came. So that's my other big question. Yeah. Do you think he shows up again after his disappearance? Because uh, in this season, you mean? Yeah, you yeah. Shows up? Yeah. Well, this series, this series has also really stayed away from the stinger and the cutscene. You know, there hasn't been one yet. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm wondering if he might pop up in that form, you know, maybe at the end of the show or something like that as a way to bridge the gap to, to the to the next appearance he might make in the in the MCU. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, that that would be interesting to see because he certainly I mean he's part of the Thunderbolts, right? Yep. So Whenever they get to introduce that, I'm sure he's going to be a part of it. Let us know what you think in the comment section below about this episode. Uh, number four, it was fantastic in our opinion. Uh, let's move on to a show that I can't wait for every Friday because it keeps getting better and better. Is the Invincible. Invincible. That's the name of the show. Invincible. Episode five. The twists and turns that happen in this show is is is, is just amazing to me. Um, Mahershala Ali never does a bad performance. 
uh, his his character's name was what I, I forgot what his, was it, what his character's name was in this episode. Spoiler for anyone who hasn't watched it, you guys got to yeah, watch. Yeah, there's it a lot one. of characters. By the way, that's one of the things with this show. There's an enormous amount of names and characters. Yeah. I don't know. Is it? Oh, I can't remember what it's like. Yeah. I, yeah, He's like the that, dude right? that turns into uh, like concrete or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, at the end of this, there is a battle that is very is carnage all over, blood all over the place, and the twist that happens at the end of it, you're like, oh snap! It's just really, really well done. I'm still looking forward to seeing that moment because as you know, what you saw what they did with uh, Mark Grayson's blood at the end. Yeah, right. So they're trying the to figure it out. Yeah. Yes, yeah. They, they're trying to figure it out. They're yeah. trying to figure it out. I'm not going to say too much more about that, but they're trying to figure it out. And Omni Man, Th that scene where he's just hovering and watching you think he's just what do you what do you think he's doing i i because I, I'm, I'm i'm trying to figure him out so this show really is using a, a, i believe the tool we call this dr dramatic irony so we are being made aware at every step of the way what the twists are Meanwhile, the characters in the show are not. Yeah. So they're in the dark. So we're kind of in the, no, don't, don't trust that guy. <laughs> oh, don't go in there. Like, we know that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So as best we can tell, Omni-Man is prepping Earth for invasion, but a very specific kind of invasion, right? Because he, at the end of episode two, they deliberately show him going to the other world after they go through that series of battles with that sort of lizard-like, or I don't know what to call them, green alien race. And he destroys the entire planet. And he says, Earth is not yours to conquer, which is definitely worded in such a way that it means like it's mine to take yeah, over. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which then gets carried through to like, I think there's a part of him that's like, with his own son, he can't decide what to do with him. Like on the one hand, he wants to, he's clearly kind of rooming him and recruiting him. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, I think he's like, do I have to kill this guy? Do I have to destroy him because he's going to be in my way for what? What? So I think that's part of why he's, you know, we're kind of putting to his eyes to sort of see what's going on. Because I think there's probably like a, this is a bad analog, but he's kind of like the Steppenwolf for some dark side we haven't really seen yet. That's been my feel, is like he's there to mm -hmm. kind of prep, scout, reconnaissance, and get everything ready. And then mm -hmm. there's something, because this show, the other thing, I don't know what your view is on this. I was not expecting this to be as intergalactic as it has been. Like we've been a lot of places, been a lot of species, a lot of like, I also mean like the sheer volume of this show is amazing week to week. So that's why I'm now my expectations are really high. Yeah. That as we get toward the final battle, like there's going to be other worlds and galaxies that are coming into play that Mark and his, his little team are going to have to somehow stand up to. Yeah. How many episodes is this? 10? I think it's, Oh, you might be right. It's ten. It's eight, eight or ten. But yeah, definitely. I don't. I, I, I'm. I don't know if we'll probably get at the end of this. Uh, my my guess is that at the end of this, will we will get some sort of solution that Cease was trying to fi find 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 a way how to defeat this guy when it comes to it. I don't know if we'll get that. that reveal of him trying to take over the world just yet i don't know well do you th think here's the other question do you think omni-man is pure evil in the end or do you think there's any chance this is a silver surfer galactus type of relationship i mean after watching that the end of episode one you gotta be like yo He's i don't know about, I, I, yeah i don't know about pure I think he's more like a Zod sort of sort of guy. Okay. I'm just wondering if there's any. I've used the the, the Luke Vader 
analogy and i'm kind of like is there any chance that this guy pulls a an anakin vader turn, yeah, you know yeah. you know face turn at the end of this somehow that'll be that's that and that's going to be an interesting scene if it comes to it when he has to choose between his family and whatever it is that the, the ultimate mm -hmm. end game of this so that's yep. going to be interesting to see if you guys haven't watched invincible it, Please watch it, it. It's one of the, it's hard for us to spoil it for you other than to create the the drama and the scale because yeah. you really once you're in it like I said this has a almost game of thrones type of level of you need to really be on the names and all this, the kind of subplots it's, yeah. it's a lot we we not this has definitely been a a really pleasant surprise. Oh yeah. Like the way this was marketed versus how grand this is I've been very very impressed. Yeah, I was dying when I was listening to uh, the computer dude and his voice is auto tune. <laughs> and he's there were moments where they make him have a little melody to what he's saying. <laughs> it was hilarious. But yo, this is a very entertaining show. If you guys haven't watched the missile, but you gotta watch it. You gotta watch it. You gotta watch it. Um, Jupiter's legacy, Brian, when the thing that I noticed about this trailer, and this is a comic, uh, book, uh, that they're bringing to Netflix live action that I've never read. Um, so again, this is sort of watching this with fresh eyes, the same way as we were watching Invincible, never read the comic, but it, we're very much enjoying the show. Um, and I'm looking forward to this show, Jupiter's Legacy. What I enjoyed the most of this trailer is, and I mentioned it to you in text, is the color of their suits. These are being, from what I can tell and what I've seen, they're showing you straight out the comics the color of the suits because in the past you wouldn't think to put the x-men's colors in live action you wouldn't think to put even though the in marvel they sort of go it's a little bit darker uh a look to it but the colors are still there and this one the colors are bright and they look yep. fantastic yep are you looking forward to this show? And by the way, this show is is just you know, it just, it seems like a soap opera, right? Yes. In that, yeah, you, you, the 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 family is a bunch of superheroes, and they have kids, and they're the next in line to take over that role, and they have to prove themselves. I'm looking forward to this show, Brian. What do you think? Yeah, look, it's got it's got a good pedigree too, because I mean, so Mark Millar is the the writer of it. You might, if you ever saw um, Wanted with uh, James McAvoy, Angelina Jolie, Morgan Freeman, that was a, he directed that actually. So mm -hmm. um, he's got his hooks in some abstract comics, and then Stephen Denight, who is actually directing and showrunning this, he's got kind of a long history in sort of televised comic book so he was uh he did a number of episodes on smallville back in the day and he also directed and wrote several episodes of the marvel daredevil series uh, he was not the original creator of it but he stepped in as especially i think he was more like in season three actually which was which was amazing he kind of got more involved so it seems like it's in pretty good hands i agree with you the look of it was really impressive i thought the effects looked great the action looked like oh, I'll, I'll see the rest of these scenes um, and, and it's funny, we just had this discussion with Invincible talking about superpowered kids and superpowered parents. And like, here's another variant of that theme. It seems yeah. like, right, Josh Dumel is sort of the, I don't know, Superman equivalent. And his, his two children are kind of like punks or, you know, rebels and having trouble dealing with this. And, and this seems like a lot of kind of, it seems like we're going to be living almost Godfather 2 style. Like we're going to kind of be in the past and then in the present. And that's that's sort of an interesting, like we're gonna almost see two shows in one. Yes, yes. 
But uh, I agree with you. The the color scheme and the and the cinematography really stood out. And like when we saw a couple of the super powered effects and fights and just sort of cutscenes, I was like, oh, these look pretty impressive. Again, more big budget yeah. theater than television. So yeah, consider me curious. I mean, so far we've been hitting home runs with you know whether it's um, the boys or uh, Umbrella Academy. I mean, we basically hit home runs with all these types of shows right now. So, I mean, hopefully this one is kind of in that in that vein. Yeah. So yeah, let us know what you guys think in the comment section below about Jupiter's Legacy. Uh, are you guys looking forward to seeing that? Um, again, it looks fantastic and I'm very much looking forward to seeing how this is going to look in terms of obviously the power uh, the acting, the, the visual effects, because this looks something like new stuff. Yeah. Almost what like Justice League should have looked like. Anyway, let's get into the Ray Fisher situation. And I'll read, I mean, I, I read the article that you sent me Brian and it was it was a it was a pretty good article in t- and it led us into what was sort of happening with him the individuals that were being accused by Ray, Ray Fisher of doing them doing him dirty and also Gal Gadot had issues with Josh Sweet and everybody who who who's in this world uh, 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 you know, know about this now. I gotta ask you one question about Josh Whedon is his career over, man? Well, listen, I mean, I think if you, uh, let's put it this way if you take the sum total of everything that's been laid out about him from you know, Puppy, the Firefly, to now Justice League. And by the way, his experience with the Avengers is strangely absent from all this. I will just say, I find that one of the oddest moments is we've never heard anything about that set. It makes me wonder. Yeah. But if you just add up everything that's come out of that, I mean, what is the percentage of that that has to be true for you to feel like this guy should not work again? Right? Yeah. It's not that high, to be honest. Like, yeah. like even if you said half of what's in here is true, yeah. it's more than bad enough to say, like, come on, man, like, that's not what they, that's, And an amazing hypocrisy for a guy who's a lot of his legacy as a creator was about strong female characters and you know pro-feminist i think he got an award for that at some point actually yeah and you know you come to find out like i mean the interactions with gall and you know dating like could this guy be any more chauvinist or any more despicable in some of these interactions that's even before you get there, that his stuff with Ray Fisher personally. I get this article almost felt like it became less about Ray Fisher's own crusade and more about sort of what was going on just in general on the set. And I think the Gal Gadot exchange became the more higher profile sort of WTF that was going on here. But, yeah, yeah. you know, look, I mean, to get back to your main question, I think he's definitely out of the game for a while. I never say never just because I feel like, you know, the cynic in me says there's a lot of less than stellar characters in Hollywood who have done a lot of less than stellar things who don't necessarily seem to go away permanently. Yeah. But it's going to take a, how do you think it's going to take quite a bit of time for that to even, for, for any studio to even think about touching him as a, a showrunner or a director. I mean, I think there would be an outcry from both audience and prospective cast that they don't want to work with this guy or don't yeah. want to have him 
I mean, his show, The Nevers, is coming out on HBO Max, and his name has been, you know, deleted from all yeah. references to that as he's yeah. been asked to leave. So, I don't know. I, let's do it this way. I, 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 I finished reading the article, and I've read all the stuff about him, and I just was like, okay, even if 10% of this is true, it's awful. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you've watched this show, uh, even prior, even prior to Brian um, uh, joining us on this show, we were talking about the Ray Fisher situation for quite some time, and initially we were like, "Yo, Ray, what what are you doing? What do you think you're gonna get from this? What do you want from this?" And we went in on him, but after reading this. It seems to me that all he wants is an acknowledgement that this environment wasn't right. If they, there was something wrong with how they did this movie with respect to how they treated people, especially how they treated him. Um, Cause, and we've said in, in, in previous shows, there was no reason to cut his scenes out of his, out of Justice League, other than you having an issue with him. Um, so that's what I think. With Ray Fisher wanting an apology, an apology, and and I and I think, you know, them removing Josh Whedon from future projects. Um, finally releasing a Snyder Cut wasn't enough. I think Ray is looking for an apology so that it, they can, it could be admitted that this was a messed up environment that they were working under. Um, I don't think he's going to get it, but I understand where he's coming from. I think he's shedding light to what possibly goes on on a regular basis, possibly. And for them to apologize to him openly would be to admit that there's a culture in in this 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 uh, in Hollywood that is unacceptable. But you know this has been the norm for because we, we we you know we're not insiders we don't know what goes on behind the scenes for the most part we just watch the movie and think is great or is it we generally don't care what's going on right unless somebody speaks out unless something egregious is happening um what were your thoughts after reading that ray fisher uh article yeah i, I think it may i think to your point it made a little bit more clear what closure for him would look like it's mm. not just because he references i think it was john berg called him and apologized to him and I guess must have apologized to him in a way that he found satisfactory because he says I'm not beyond forgiveness yeah. and so he almost kind of crossed him off the list but I think his version of the apology looks more like a public statement of guilt from the studio not just about the set of Justice League, but the motivations for what happened, right? The racial motivations for the removal of his character, which he's very clear in saying. Yeah. He has that quote in there where it's like, they, his belief is, you know, Zack Snyder, Chris Terrio, the writers set up Cyborg as the heart and soul of this movie, which we have heard. That's, they were, they've said that publicly. And he's like, the studio did not want a, you know, did not want him as the central heartbeat because of the color of his skin that that is the his view of what happened and so i think an apology is not a generic apology for ray feeling slighted i think it's a specific apology is what he wants an apology for the racially insensitive culture that led to a racially motivated decision at the center of justice league and I, you know 
this is one thing where the Snyder Cut has only added fuel to this mm -hmm. fire because as you and I remarked, we don't often get to see two versions of the same film side by side. That is the most damning evidence out there is when you see his part restored versus what it became in the theatrical version, how do you not have questions? Yeah. At the very least, how do you not sit there and say, okay, what are the list of reasons why this original version gets butchered into what the theatrical... Like, you, you can't not at least wonder. Yeah. You can't... Right? I, I just, I don't, like, I don't care where you stand on the generic issue. I just, you watch the two films and you're like, there is something else underneath this decision. I would like to see whoever was involved with taking out, whoever made that decision of taking out that scene, I would want to hear their explanation as to why they thought that scene didn't work. That would be, you, you, you can't explain it to me that makes sense. No. I hear you. I hear you. Now, it doesn't, you know, there's no perfect solution either. It's like, okay, so let's say he got that, then what? Like, this is still, you know what I mean? Then what? Like, he gets his closure. Okay, I appreciate that. But as I said, this article really branched off more, I thought, into the Joss versus Gall fight, which she apparently took to the studio head and felt like she got some kind of traction because her own statement was the studio dealt with it and I'm cool. Yeah. And I have to ask the other question which is do you think this had anything to do with what happened with wonder woman 84 in terms of them getting special treatment getting special paydays for that film do you think that was her and patty cashing in a little bit as like listen i got i got raped in the justice league reshoot you know you guys owe me whatever we want because the, the article definitely portrays her and jenkins as a tandem a team in this fight mm -hmm. i wonder if they use that as leverage to say look it's going to be 12 million it's going to be 15 million whatever the price is going to be we're going to name it and you're going to pay it and you're going to set up our movie the way we want because they got treated differently than everyone else in the shift I, see, I, I can see the racial aspect in that sense how gal was treated when she had a problem with something Whereas when Ray had a problem with something, they 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 completely like just took out his parts. Right? I can see that part of it. Um yeah, I mean I I, I can see that all, as well as them wanting to screw him over because of because he was being difficult. Let's say that. Let's call it that. He was being difficult. He wanted, he wasn't comfortable with doing certain things. At the end of the day, he did them. But he, you know, he didn't, I probably he didn't do it. There was, there was a lot of tension there. And I guess to, to screw him over, they, 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 because there's no, again, there's no way you cut those scenes out and, and justify that to, to anyone. Other than you just didn't like the guy and you guys didn't take him seriously, you wanted to mess with him and you took his scene out. Whether it was racially, that's the, that's the part I, I struggle with. But if you put it that way, with with the gal was taken care of, even though her scenes and some of those weren't that great. But with Ray, they took him out. That's where you can probably splash some racism in there or, or some racial motivation. And it kind of makes sense. I get that. But um, yeah. I hope I could listen, I think Ray is a great actor. He's a good actor. He's a good actor. He he did a fantastic job as cyborg. 
I want to see him in other stuff. I was almost casting him as um, if they ever do the Last Dragon again, put him as Bruce Leroy. <laughs> you know, um, but. I want to see him act. I hope this doesn't deter. I mean, he he says, listen, he hasn't been in the game long enough for them, for him to, you know, if they don't want to hire him and he's cool with it. He does. He, you know, he hasn't had a long career in it. It's like he doesn't depend on it or whatever the case may be. But I would like to see him in more, more things because I think he's a good actor and I'd like to see him in other stuff. What do you think? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think the Snyder, the, there's no way the Snyder Cut is not a meaningful positive for his career prospects when yeah. you see it. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it rehabilitates whatever you thought of him coming out of the theatrical cut of Justice League. Mm. So it's, there's no doubt about that. He's the character who gained the most by virtue of those two films appearing side by side. And yeah, I think you hope he goes on to have something else. Uh, in, in a weird way, I, I hope it's not more cyborg. I hope it's not, you know, if HBO Max goes the route of re resurrecting the Snyderverse and having Zach carry forward his vision, there's a part of me that almost feels like I think Ray would just do better with a fresh start somewhere else. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think he's typecast as cyborg, but I think if he did it for another five years, and then kept having to deal with the questions tying back to this situation. I almost feel like he does run the risk of being yeah. that forever. Yeah. Whereas I think if he can break free now, he and find some more meaningful roles because of the work that we've now seen. Yeah. I almost think that might be better for his his long term longevity. But he's already said that Zach, because of he feels a, a debt of obligation to Zack Snyder for discovering him and casting him that if he ever calls him, um, he'll pick up the phone. Now, I guess the other subplot would be if Zack goes to Netflix, I can definitely see a situation where Ray Fisher shows up in a Zack oh, Snyder yeah. production over there. That oh, actually yeah. might be the most likely outcome if Snyder winds up over there. Yeah. Uh, let us know in the comment section below what you think about this Ray Fisher situation. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting one. It's been a long storyline. It's been a year or so of this, and I think it's finally possibly come to its conclusion. Well, uh, we've been waiting for him to say his piece, and this yeah. was him finally saying his piece. So yeah. if nothing else, you at least have in the open no more cryptic references. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's not, I think it's ironic, though, that, you know, Warner Brothers always finds itself at the heart of the news, and it feels like every week it's a, you know, you have a plus, whether it's, you know, Godzilla versus Kong is doing incredibly well and sustaining some momentum, and then you have this, and it's like a reminder of what this studio has kind of been about for the last mm, five, yeah. ten years, right? It's mm, like yeah. one step forward, two steps back, one step forward, two steps back. That's yeah. what this story kind of felt like. Yeah. Yeah, let us know in the comment section below what you think about all this. Um, Netflix. And I have to say, Brian, that before you came on to the show, I don't know, you probably heard one of the shows where, we, we, where the worst streaming wars came up. And I have to give credit where credit is due. Tracy Spivey and Egan Entertainment said a long time ago that this was going to start and this was probably like three years ago. Call it the streaming wars. And it's been elevated to a point where money is being thrown at situations just so that they can have this IP. Whatever IP it may be. People are throwing money at it so they can have it. So that people can subscribe and um, pay the money and hopefully keep them. Netflix has paid 400 million. At least. Yeah. For the next two films of Knives Out, Ryan Johnson and Daniel C Craig each got 100 mil. What precedence does this set for the rest of the industry? Are other actors going to point to, hey, this guy got this 
what are you guys going to pay me for this? Are we getting to that point where directors and actors are going to be asking for extraordinary amount of money to produce content for these film for these uh, studios? It's getting crazy. A hundred million dollars. That's ridiculous. What are your thoughts on this, uh, Brian? It's not going to stop. Um, Netflix also did a deal, if you saw, with Sony, where they're going to get exclusive rights to, among other things, Spider-Man. 2022. The whole well, not Spider-Man right? in terms of the theatrical production, but once it leaves theaters and comes to streaming, it has to go to Netflix. Yeah. They paid simply for that exclusivity. Uh, and then it will also include Venom, Morbius, basically the comic book library of, of some. Yeah, look, it's an arms race. And and the reality is, you know, a company like Netflix right now, on the one hand, has a lot of cash coming in because of, you know, certainly with the pandemic, subscriber growth was ahead of whatever they probably thought it was going to be for the last 12 plus months. And they've raised prices steadily a little bit over the last couple of years. You know, on the flip side, not to go too financial on people, but interest rates are incredibly low. So the ability to go borrow additional funds to bid for things like this is easier than it ever has been. All right? So it's like cash in, you know, via actual cash flow, cash in via low cost debt. Yeah. You have a, you have a war chest. Yeah, yeah. to go shopping and you're up against you know Disney knowing that Disney has at the end of the day it does have one limiting factor which is the Disney brand itself precludes Disney from bidding for certain types of assets because of the historically family friendly nature of the company right there is always a subset of the universe to which Disney is going to view themselves as an inappropriate host. For them. But, but they have Hulu, don't they? They have. They other... do. So they've branched this out, right? They've branched this out. The R and obviously R rated Marvel. They're figuring out ways to do that. But my point is, they're never going to be a blanket R rated yeah, platform. Yeah, yeah. That's not how they're built. Mm -hmm. So I think there's windows here where Netflix feels like, okay, we can we can maneuver around, around that. And what we want to box out is we want to box out HBO Max, we want to box out Peacock, we want to box yeah. out Paramount Plus. Like, right? That's where we want to basically make ourselves we're either one or one A. Yeah. And, and I think you're seeing it on a lesser scale with actually the launch of Peacock. So that's an interesting one because a lot of Universal Studio stuff right now is spread through other services. So like HBO Max, I think, has the Fast and Furious franchise right now, if you were to go on there. But that's a universal movie. And so Peacock is, as NBC Universal, is now thinking about, do we take back all that IP to make our own service more valuable to subscribers? Which is, well, duh, of course they're going to. Yeah. So you're seeing this reshuffling of the deck and it's, it's, it's leading to a pecking order, I think, of these assets, right? Mm -hmm. And so right now you probably mm -hmm. safely say that Disney and Netflix will be on top. I think Amazon is maybe a little bit of an X factor just because of Amazon's the, the parent company size. And some of their big bets we have yet to see, right? So re Without Remorse is coming at the end of this month from Michael B. Jordan, Tom Clancy book. The Lord of the Rings universe is supposed to launch right in the next year. That's going to be a huge play for them. Yeah. So they're probably the third in terms of having the deep pockets to bid for whatever they want, where we haven't seen them be as active yet. They've been more focused on original content as opposed to bringing in outside content but it kind of feels like they ultimately will be in the top three if they want to be just because of the size and then you have the second tier of can we make ourselves attractive enough to be ultimately i think acquired right so that's the hbo max the paramount the peacock 
mm -hmm. uh, Discovery mm -hmm. Plus, like all those types of places. Their end game is to really just make themselves as attractive as possible and cash out. I think yeah, yeah, that yeah, would yeah. be my general guess. And it's just a matter of money. Yeah, yeah. So the short answer is, it seems crazy. But let me turn this around on you for a second. So Ryan Johnson had $100 million for Knives Out. Ryan Johnson makes you money historically. Like if you look at the track record, whether it's small budget or big, right? So small budget, looper, Knives Out, big hits. Yeah, yeah. You can, you can kill Last Jedi all you want. It still did 620 US and almost 1.5 global. Yeah, like, yeah. so he didn't, he didn't bring a shame to the studio from a financial standpoint. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you hand him $100 million for two movies. So it's $50 million a movie. If the movies just matched what they did last time, you're probably happy with that, I think, if you're Netflix. I don't know. Is it that bad of an and, and if you're getting your hooks into him creatively for the long run, as I said, and he's a guy who has historically made money I think Netflix over a five to 10 year period would tell you we stole that guy at a hundred million dollars. Not that we overpaid for him. Do, do these movies though come out on Netflix or in theaters? I believe the Knives Out movies come out on Netflix now. They don't go to theaters. Okay. The Sony deal is post theatrical streaming. Yeah. Yeah. So you're banking on people getting subscriptions to Netflix based on those films that he produces. Uh, for yeah, you. you know, it, it, it's like I said, I mean, we talked about it with Chris Nolan with Warner Brothers. It's, it's viewing the asset as the brain of an individual. That's what you're buying, right? And you're saying that like the, the, the cash flow is the stream of IP that that person creates over the next decade. Or if it's an actor, like I think Ryan Reynolds said, right, he has a deal with Netflix, right? Anything that Ryan Reynolds touches, if you believe that's going to bring viewership, then twenty million a pop for Ryan Reynolds is a good is a good. Pop. I don't know. I mean, is that that's how they're thinking. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying that's how they're thinking about it, right? And like Six Underground is a crazy whacked out movie, but I think like eighty five million people watched it last year. Yeah. yeah. I haven't so, seen it. And that's, is that the only thing that he's done on, on Netflix? So far, because he's doing the Red Notice one with The Rock and Gall. That's coming. Okay. That's really expensive. But I think, and I think there's something else behind that. But yeah, they basically own his work and his production. Yeah. So, where are at. Yeah, let us know what you think, where this is going to head out. Every, every actor and director going to be like, yo, uh, how much you going to give us? Because these guys, you know, is they, they're, they're like the bar now. It's like, if, if I'm dope, I want to be paying. I want to get paid dope money. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, that's what you have to now deal with. Are, are people... Are streaming platforms going to are going to be willing to pay this these numbers these type of numbers for IP? Well, also keep an eye out for how early in the career these places are willing to bid. So I think the the historical path is it is really different. Like these days, the path like look at Chloe Zhao, right? It's like now the path has changed from you make a few indie films and then you look to make the jump to a Marvel, a Star Wars, or like actually better example, um, Emerald Fennel, who like promising young woman gets nominated for Golden Globe and Oscar. She's in the mix. That's like really the first thing she's ever done of sort of critical note. Now she's doing Zatanna for, I mean, this is what this is. But there's also a lot of cautionary tales here. Like if I told you after Chronicle, I mean, Josh Crank, right? He got a Star Wars film and he had Fantastic Four and like, look what happened to his career. Yeah. So you got to be careful who you bid for too. So I'm curious to see as this arms race escalates, 
do you start to see younger filmmakers being guaranteed a lot of upfront money and bets being made on people who have one film, yeah. two films on their resume that just happened to hit versus, like I said, Ryan Johnson, at least you can say this guy proved he can make money at small budget and big budget already before you paid it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let us know what you guys think in the comment section below about all of this. Is the money getting too crazy for some of these actors and, 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 and directors? But yet again, you know, you, you're in, you're in a competition and you got to get uh, the people that are going to create dope content onto your platform. Well, I tell you one guy who is going to cash in because of these deals is Nolan. Oh yeah. Oh, because yeah. he's gonna look at that and be like, "Wait, what? You paid you paid hundred million for that? <laughs> Let me show you my resume." <laughs> Definitely, that's within the next few months we'll probably hear something because he, you know, he he's out of Warner Brothers. That's the word. So let's see what happens. Maybe Warner Brothers be like, "Hey, we'll give you one hundred twenty. You stay." You never it's not one hundred twenty. If it's a hundred for those guys, he's like. Yeah, you'd be looking for like 500 million. <laughs> like it's going to be some insane <laughs> number. I'm yeah, you, it's going to be ten, insane. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, they're going to lock him in forever. Yeah. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our final topic, something that we've been talking about for quite some time, the inner workings of the MCU, how this all gets done, how this all gets created. The Parliament was first mentioned, and I first took notice. Did you send me an article about this? Or did I just discover it and sent it to you? I think you sent it to me. Okay. You mean the writer of the, the, yeah. the one yeah. this year? Yeah, I think yeah, you yeah. sent that one to me. So, Derek Colstad, he's uh, one of the writers for The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, um, made mention of a group who are the people who who have created this MCU universe and they're called the Parliament. you know for all this time that we've been doing the show we've been wondering you know how is Kevin you know Kevin is the man Kevin is the man let's put it out there Kevin is the man but he can't do it alone there's no way that he's reading all these scripts and putting all these connections between films and now Disney Plus series into this world. He needs some assistance, right? I would call it the mastermind group. I don't know if you ever read that book. I forget how to, I forget that book. You know what, I'm what book I'm talking about? No. The master, the mastermind group. If you guys look it up, there was a, this dude that wrote uh, a book on how to be a millionaire. I forget what it was called. Anyway, he has this mastermind group of individuals who sort of say yay or nay on sort of storylines. And I guess Kevin has the final uh, say on what gets pushed through. Um, so Derek Colstad wrote about um, or spoke about how, you know, he, they have th these ideas and these guys, the parliament reads it and they hand them back a bunch of notes and well-written notes, according to him. They're not conflicting. They're not confusing. Um, they're, they're, they're not necessarily exactly what the writer had, you know, created but certainly they approve the, the 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 where you're going with this how do you and they've even started hiring a story manager now they have someone or they're going to get someone in place to manage all these story so that, that, that so you don't have to think about all these plot holes or whatever the case may be Brian how are they getting oh how do you think that this is this is is this a first in in I, I guess it is because 
you've never seen a universe this large before. 23 films in. What are your what are your thoughts on this Hope Hardeman situation? Well, as I said when we first teased this, it, it, it is like a piece of the comics come to life. I mean, this is the, the end of Avengers. It's Nick Fury talking to the council, and the, like Howard's booth, like being like, is that what this was all about? Mm -hmm. Like, it's those people. And I think it makes a lot of things make a lot more sense. Yeah. Because as much as we hear Kevin Feige's name attached to so many great things over the past 12 years, there's just a physical impossibility that he could have been in that many places at once. A so, mental, a mental impossibility. We're right. So, <laughs> you know, it, it just is always spoken to, there had to be a layer of infrastructure that we just were not aware of. And yeah. now we're starting to find out what that looks like. And so it's about 15 individuals. And as you said, it's continuing to expand. So my first, my first response is, as usual, smart planning, right? The idea of if we were to make the comparison to Star Wars, which has hit bumps in the road and now we hope has been righted, but there's a universe that was the brainchild of one man with a vision and was kind of allowed to remain one man with a vision mm -hmm. past the point where one person could really adequately manage everything that was entailed with Star Wars. Yeah. And so here you see they had the personnel in place to manage something of much greater scale than where they were at. Yeah. And so now you're at a point where it's like, yeah, you really need all hands on deck because we're going in all these directions. When 10 years ago, they probably didn't even know, these 15 people didn't even know if they were going to have a job, you yeah, know, yeah, in, yeah. in a couple of years. So, yeah. you know, smart planning ahead. I think the other thing too is some of the names have popped up on Reddit, because I think this, this group is being credited. You can find them in seven credits if you look mm -hmm. hard enough. Mm -hmm. I would guess every one of them is immersed and bleeds and lives the characters in some way, which is healthy because they don't, which means that many people are not going to agree on every character and every story, which means you get output, which is the product of multiple viewpoints, mm -hmm. which more often than not means you get better products. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I think we would agree. Like. You can have the most visionary one person, but that one person is not going to be right all the time. Of course. And so when you have 15 people or 16 people, you usually can find a consensus yeah. that more often than not is going to be good. And as we said, I think we have to give them some credit for Marvel's ability to course correct. Because we said that's the other thing Marvel does really well is recognize mistakes and say this. So if you have 16 people, much higher probability one of them is going to be like, hey, guys, this ain't working. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. we tried this. Yeah, yeah. And it means there's probably plan B, C, and D sitting on the cutting room floor just waiting to be implemented. So they kind of know, like, all right, if this doesn't work, we're gonna go over here. If this doesn't yeah, work, yeah. we're gonna go over here. Yeah, yeah. So it really does speak to the collaborative process of getting these things off the ground and out the door and how they're not form they're not formulated. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of choices that are made here. So it was really exciting to kind of hear that described and validated. Definitely, definitely. And just reading about, you know, how they, you know, s sit and talk about from in the morning till they leave, they're, like you said, immersed in this world and making sure that these stories are aligned so much to the point now that they're, again I'm going to, they're they're hiring someone to manage all of these stories so that we don't have none of these conflicts and this just says to us as well is that there is no end in sight for how far they're going to go with this 
And I'm pretty sure they have five or 10 years planned out for the next iteration of movies. And again, with the Disney Plus show, what we got with Endgame, that whole that whole number of films that we got until we reached that 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 moment in time is going to be shortened because we have Disney Plus. We have these other stories that fit together for the grand scheme until that that big event where we get an Avengers film or a big event. Like for for example, I'm I'm pretty sure that for Secret Invasion, that final the ending of that will probably be his own movie. It's going to be a huge event. But to hear this, man, and, and now you, you're hearing, you know, DC are starting to think about going down this path as well. We're building this universe. How interconnected is going to be now that they have all these multiverse of the, I, you know, Again, they're speeding ahead because of they, they don't have time to lay down groundwork, it seems. I think it, it, it made me think about some of the Disney Plus shows a little bit differently. And it made me think about the HBO Max shows a little bit differently. So I think when we got the list, we got the roster of the shows and we did our rankings. I looked at the shows in two ways. One is if they were a continuation of a character we had already seen in the films, okay, that made sense, I get it. If it was a new character, I thought about it initially as they chose the character first. As I'm watching WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier, I'm becoming less convinced that that's true. I'm becoming more convinced that this group is looking at the universe first. And the shows and the characters you're getting are the ones that fit what they're trying to do with the universe. Yeah. So. And I think that's a really crucial distinction because I think on the DC side, I still think there's a little bit more of this character would be cool to have on screen. Let's throw it on screen. Whereas I feel like here, they are going to probably draw out X-Men and Fantastic Four, probably longer. I know they've committed to the one Fantastic Four film, but I actually feel like they're going to draw that process out longer than we would probably think, or maybe even like. How long do you because think? Because of the foundation they're building does not require and doesn't really ask for yeah. those characters yet. How long do you and think, think before we get them? Yeah, and I think quite honestly, I'm sure that of the Disney Plus shows and characters, they probably have a view of what are the biggest risks and what are the big, what are the safest bets. And I'm yeah. sure they're wanting to find out, like, where is the audience going to fail for something? Because it is, right? That's important information. But I don't think any of these characters is random anymore. I, I really think that this is part of a larger construction of this multiverse board that they're putting together. And what you're seeing kind of fits into the fabric in some way. Now, we can talk about the She-Hulk little blurb that was dropped this week and say, my concerns only go up when I see the words legal comedy next to Hulk in the yeah, same sentence. Yeah, I just yeah. put my head in my hands. But they're trying something. That's probably what the answer to that is. I don't think it's going to work, but we'll see. And wow. That's, I think that's where we're at, but that's, like I said, I think it's very exciting. When you talk about the story manager, I think what that person honestly is there to do is to really reality check the MCU to say, listen, if I've got somebody who's going to the theater and doesn't give a hoot about Disney Plus, that person has to be entertained and can't be confused. Can't, it, it, it doesn't work. It, it can't be totally connected. It has to be independent enough to still work for that audience. 
True. But I could have sworn that at some moment Kevin Feige had mentioned that for some, in order to get some context, that you have to you'd have to watch one of these shows. Yeah. Like for example, uh Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. I don't know if you necessarily have to watch WandaVision to to get. But you certainly have to see where she comes from, right? And how her powers have developed. If you saw the last film, um, Infinity War and Endgame, where you don't really see a lot of this, the display of power that she shows in those films versus the, the show are substantial. They're somewhat different. And now she's the Scarlet Witch. Right. If you watch the movie, and the, the I'm talking about Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness, and he says Scarlet Witch, so the word, the name Scarlet Witch, and and you hadn't heard that name before, you would have known that it was mentioned in the, in the Disney Plus show if you if you watched it. But if you if you're watching it for the first time in the movie and they say the name, you know when did that happen? Where did she get this outfit from? You know what I'm saying? Things there, there's certain things that are going to connect to each other. Well, right. And so the movie is going to, on the one hand, the studio is going to want the movie to pique your interest about Disney Plus. But my point is, it cannot exclude the person who doesn't ex- subscribe because if it does, then that yeah. person is less likely to come back for the next film. So mm-hmm. it has to be standalone enough that you walk out of there and give it an A cinema score. And you feel happy about the twenty dollars you spent, and you're excited about the next Marvel movie on a very surface level. Mm-hmm. But if you are a subscriber and you are nerds like we are, yeah. it it has layers and depth that make it so much more rewarding. Yeah, and I think that's great. If they can pull that off, that's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Listen, I've always said, man, that I always wondered. Before, I think when Marvel first started off with their first set of films, I was like, I was hoping for some situation what, of what they're doing now. And it's amazing to me that they've been able to do it, is create this world where you can just put out movie after movie after movie for however long you're able to do it and have fans keep coming back. And, 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 and this vast world of content that puts all that stuff together it's just remarkable to me that they've been able to do it and now you're sort of getting a glimpse as to how they're able to do this because obviously you know as we said kevin is you know kevin is the guy but he has people around him that are able to wrap their heads around certain situation and, and storylines and put it all together and, and, and give us what we're watching right now on Disney Plus and in the future movies that are going to be put out. It's just remarkable, man. And, and it's, listen, no, people want to argue DC should do whatever. They shouldn't follow Marvel. Sure. You can say that. But imagine if they did. What universe, DCU universe, we would have gotten if they pulled storylines from the from the comic books and put it on screen. Are you gonna sit there and tell me that you wouldn't have watched it? That you wouldn't have been interested in seeing that? Doom. Um Justice League War, World's Finest, all these storylines, the, the, the Hyper Clan, all this stuff that's been put out in the comics, you're going to tell me that you wouldn't have been interested in watching it. Instead, you, we're talking about the Snyderverse. The Snyderverse to me is not even about DC. DC is about Snyder. It's about his vision. I don't care about his vision. I care about DC and the characters that are in there. That's what I care about. 
You know, that's what my, that's what I care about. Not someone's vision. Because it's his. This is all his. There's no parliament in the Snyderverse. There's only Snyder and what he wants. He did what he did. We need to move on from that. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for today. You got anything to say about that, Brian? No, I mean, I think with regard to the, the copycatting stuff, I mean, copycatting something like the parliament has nothing to do with copycatting what goes up on the screen, uh, to be quite honest. I mean, yeah. I think you'd be well served copycatting that just because it's good process. I mean, it's a good example of how to manage a large universe, which DC is also trying to do with their multiverse approach. Yeah. So that has nothing to do with the tone, the style, the visualization of the character. That can all be different. Yeah. That can all be different. What we're talking about is having enough voices in the room who are smart about the characters, who love the characters, who are knowledgeable about what appeals to different types of fans before decisions get made. Exactly. That, that has nothing to do with, you know, they did it so we can't. <laughs> like, it doesn't, like, I'm sorry. Like, as, as I used that sports analogy before, it's like, you know, team wins five titles in a row, you better look at what they do. That's, exactly. that's what every other team does. Exactly. That's what every other good team does. Exactly. So. Exactly. And then I, I think from the Marvel perspective, the last comment is just, I don't think we're going to really see and be able to test these theories until Doc Strange 2. Because Black Widow, Shang-Chi, Eternals, and even Spider-Man 3, which obviously is done in conjunction with Sony, those are kind of of the last era in the sense of there's no connectivity ne necessary to Disney Plus. Doc Strange yeah. 2 will be the test of yes. like how much did you actually need the show to really love this movie? We'll find out. Yeah, exactly. Um, and one more last word. I got. I just got to say this. This notion of WB letting directors do whatever they want, that's just the... That's just WB wanting money and just not being involved in that process that Marvel has over there. Well, when you do that, and this is where I've used this as a defense of WB in the past. Mm -hmm. When you do that, it just means that the volatility of your product will be higher. Yeah. It means you will get a Joker. Like, you will get a Dark Knight. Yeah. You will get some epic... Highs. No, no question. But you're also going to get the other side of that. Yeah. And it's like, are you ready and okay with having that kind of ping pong ball in your own product? Yeah. Disney and Marvel clearly are not. And I think their, you know, their challenge is more. They need a few breakout to like a plus. They need a few more Black Panthers. They need a few more breakout to sort of epic, memorable films. But right now they've locked down these sort of, you know, B to A, right? Like that's good. like your floor is B, your high, your, your high is A. I think with WB, your your high might be A plus and your floor is F. Yeah. Like that's the difference right now. Yeah. Because you know, and you you said it perfectly, is you're gonna get that high volatility because look. You got Michael Keaton, which was great, and then subsequent films, I guess Batman 2 was okay, and then after that, what do you get? A deterioration of the story, of the, right. of the character. Superman. I don't know how you can stomach Superman 3 and Superman 4. Right? Then you get a reboot that didn't really go anywhere. And, you know, it's... it's you get the it's a, it's a roll of the dice, and Marvel's not rolling the dice that hard. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's the difference. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for today. Please hit that like and subscribe button, that notification bell, share it with your friends. It really does help support the channel. We really do appreciate you guys for joining us on the show. Brian, thank you once again for your commentary. It's really always insightful, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gem Report. Yeah.